Good morning, welcome to another Let's Calc video. In this video, we're gonna be attacking the problem set focused on the quotient rule. We're gonna be using the quotient rule to differentiate a few functions that present themselves as a quotient of two or more functions. We're gonna look at writing tangent lines involving the quotient rule. We'll do some interesting kind of review-y, but focus still around the tangent rule work um, at the end. And we'll look at some of the common places where you might mess up. As always, our focus is gonna be on the problem set focused on this thing. So without further ado, let's jump into the first question. Alrighty, the first question we're going to look at is the first question of the assignment. Simply put, I'm choosing to go through number one, even though it's a fairly simple version, just to make sure that right from the beginning, everyone's established and comfortable using the quotient rule, um, possibly even using the musical um, tool that's provided for you to help you remember the quotient rule. So, um, without further ado, let's do it. So, in question number one, the function we're provided is f of x equals x plus one over x squared plus two. So, this is a rational expression, a linear over a quadratic. And more than that, I'll point out that you can't use long division to simplify this because the degree on the bottom is bigger than the degree on the top. And also that denominator is never equal to zero. So there's no vertical asymptote in this function in case that came up as a point of interest. As far as the directions, the directions instruct us to differentiate in each function and to factor or simplify each answer completely, which I don't feel like we're really going to have to do. It's more important to write each answer in an appropriate form. But for the moment, the instructions say so, so I'll just leave them up there for now. And I'll always try to do that anyway. So let's jump in. So first and foremost, the quotient rule itself. So basically think about it. The quotient rule is used when you have a situation where you have a numerator over a denominator. And there are going to be other ways you can remember the quotient rule. You could turn it into a product and chain rule problem, but we haven't learned the chain rule yet, so that might not be the best option. So instead, we have a nice tool to remember the quotient rule which in our notes we even, pro we even proved using the definition of derivative. So the way that I remember this came from my BC calculus teacher in high school, Mr. James Friedrich, recently retired, and that was a musical way to go through and remember where things go. In this case, when we talk about it, we talk about the denominator as the low function, the quote-unquote low function, and we think of the numerator as the high function. I assume each one is meant that way because of elevation, like the numerator is higher up, and then denominator is lower down. So without further ado, the way the song goes, <clears throat> low d high with implied multiplication in the middle, minus high d low with d standing for derivative, that's why I'm using the prime, all over low low quotient rule. Usually people fill in the last part. So there's what the song sounds like, so for the sake of simplicity, there's our musical notes remind you that's what's going on here. More importantly, or more relevantly though, the derivative that we're taking is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, sorry, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator, all divided by the denominator squared. So that is the quotient rule itself. That's the rule that we're going to be applying each time here. I'm gonna to try to stay organized with it. More important than that, I'm gonna to try to use the song every single time and just kind of hum it along as I go. So with our function over here on the left side, obviously x plus one is gonna play the role of our numerator. x squared plus two is gonna play the role of the denominator. And it's just up to us to fill in those pieces. So we wanna calculate f prime of x. That's going to be <clears throat> low d high. So we're gonna have to take the derivative of x plus one minus high d low, which we'll differentiate in just a few moments all over low, low quotient rule. So there's our derivative, everything's set up. We haven't obviously done the differentiating yet, but at least everything's in place. So now it's just our job to differentiate the appropriate pieces. In particular, we need to differentiate anything that's being quote unquote primed. So in there we need the derivative of x plus one, which is just one, and the derivative of x squared plus two, which is just two x. So putting all those ingredients in, we'll have one quantity x squared plus two, then minus two x quantity x plus one. And then all of that is divided by x squared plus two squared. Now technically this is an appropriate final answer. If you chose to stop, if you ran out of time, that is a correct final answer. But of course I don't like settling for those like 
unsimplified versions. I would like at least to simplify it all the way, like I always was expected to in classes. So in here, what I'm going to do then is, of course, I'm going to distribute in the 1. That's not hard because it doesn't do anything. It's the multiplicative identity. It works out fine. Second one, I'm going to distribute in negative 2x. Make sure I do distribute the negative to both of those terms. It's going to be minus 2x squared minus 2x all over low low quotient rule and then from here the only thing left would be to combine like terms as much as possible in the numerator so what I see up there is I've got x squared minus 2x squared so that looks to me like we're gonna have 2 minus x squared minus 2x all divided by x squared plus 2 squared and there is a fine final answer and of course that numerator doesn't factor at all so there's nowhere else to go from there. So in this case, you got to see the quotient rule in action being applied to a fairly simple problem. But at least now you've seen it once, you've seen the organization, you've heard the jingle a few times, you're ready to move forward. Okay, our second problem we're going to look at, also from the first section, but just a little bit harder to actually compute and work your way through the algebra for. This is question number four which presents us a function to differentiate, presumably using the quotient rule. And that function is square root of x over 3 cosine of x. So kind of uncomfortable function. Now before we jump in, let me point out to you that you could, of course, avoid this quotient rule completely in this particular problem. And there's always a way around it. It just necessarily isn't the best way to go through. In particular, what I mean here is you could look at this function as 1 third square root of x times 1 over cosine, which hopefully you'll recall, is secant of x. At this point, you know the derivative of square root, and after today's lecture, you know the derivative of secant, which means that you could work your way through just using product rule. Now, of course, that would be fun, that would be great, but my goal is not to use the product rule here. So unless I'm feeling really frisky at the end of this problem, I'm just going to let that go and just tell you that there is a way to do it, and your answer there would not be wrong. My goal, though, is to approach this using the quotient rule. So in here, if I want to calculate h prime of x and use the quotient rule, of course, I can bring in my song. Low d high minus high d low all over low, low. Quotient rule. Notice I almost accidentally put a prime down there instead of the squared, but I got it at the end. Now, as we look at this piece, of course, you might say that since these derivatives are fairly simple to compute, you don't need to actually wait and like put in the little prime symbol. You could just put the derivatives in. And yes, that's exactly how I do it normally. But again, in these videos and in the problem set solutions, I try to be as careful and demonstrative as possible with everything, make sure people don't get confused. But now that we're here, we'll get that the derivatives or the numerator is 3 cosine of x times 1 over 2 root x. Then we'll have minus square root of x times negative 3 sine of x. In fact, I'll put parentheses there for simplicity. All of this over 9 cosine squared of x. So with that in place, my next move is to try to clean this up. Again, that is technically a completely correct answer. I just want to make it a little bit better. So in looking at my numerator first, I've got 3 cosine of x over 2 square root of x. Then we've got minus or no, it'll become plus, excuse me, because of the minus and the negative. So it becomes plus. We'll have 3 square root of x times sine of x. And then, of course, all of that is over one of the worst drawn fraction bars in history, which has in the denominator 9 cosine squared of x. So we have a complex fraction as our answer right now. Not satisfying, but not the end of the world. So from here, what I want to do is I want to clean this up a little bit. Again, that's always my goal, to clean these things up as much as I can. So I notice that in my numerator, I have one part of the numerator that has a denominator and the other that does not. So I'm going to multiply up and down by that denominator to get a common one. So I'm going to multiply by 2 root x, as well as divide by 2 root x on that second term of the numerator. When I do, I end up with 3 cosine of x plus 6x sine of x all over 2 square root of x, and then all over 9 cosine squared of x. 
And by the way, I will point out to you, this is kind of a small thing, but this is something that, as an AP reader, I can warn you about. During this past summer, when I was doing the reading, and grading actual problems, we had a situation where students wrote something like this. I don't remember the specific problem off the top of my head, but they wrote something that looked like that. Unfortunately, this expression is not equivalent to this one. And more importantly, it's not correct. And the reason is the size of that denominator makes it ambiguous which part is in the numerator and which part is in the denominator. So the moral of the story is, of course, to stretch out the denominator as much as you can or to simplify further. Because if you stop at a point where there's ambiguity, we can't reasonably reason out what your expression meant to be, and we can't give you credit for that final part of your answer. So in this case, that's why I have this comically long denominator. More than that, though, I can go ahead and do a few things here to clean up. First and foremost, in my numerator, I can factor out a GCF of 3. So we'll get cosine of x plus 2x sine of x. That's always nice. And then in my denominator, I'm going to bring both of these two pieces together because we've got something, you know, it's the old a over b divided by c. It's the same thing as a over b times 1 over c. So we're going to bring those things together so that we instead get the equivalent of a over bc. And so that gives us in the denominator 18 root x cosine squared of x. And then in looking here, the 3 and the 18 will clean themselves up. That leaves me cosine of x plus 2x sine of x all over. And it looks like we've got 6 square root of cosine of x squared. So there is our answer. Now, of course, I did the, I made the mistake of teasing this whole idea that there was a product rule option. I don't want to verify for you since I have time and you know, I'm not that hungry for lunch yet. I can go ahead and verify that this is actually going to give you the same answer using the product rule. So over here, again, hopefully you are convinced that this is in fact the same function. And it is. I'm not lying to you. There will be better times to lie to you in this course. So in here, if that's h of x, I can use the product rule. I'll have one third. I'm going to treat it as this product in particular. One third times one over two root x secant of x plus one third root x times the derivative of secant, which is secant x tangent x. Now looking at these ingredients, I want to get a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply up and down by two root x. Same thing up here. That's going to give me now in my denominator, I'm going to have, let's see if we can do this correctly, we'll have six root x down there. In the numerator, we're going to have secant of x plus, let's see, this is going to now be two x secant x tangent x. And now, of course, I'm supposed to tell you that these two things are completely identical. Yeah, don't look so much that way yet. So a couple things. First, I noticed that there's a GCF of secant here. Feels a little weird. But since secant is the same thing as, I don't want to run into my head down there. Since secant is the same thing as 1 over cosine, I'm going to rewrite this as 1 plus 2x tangent of x all over 6 root x cosine of x. So in a sense, that's me factoring out a GCF of secant. Then last but not least, we have the 2x tangent of x. Keep in mind that tangent is the same thing as sine x over cosine of x. So in other words, I want a common denominator here. So I'm going to get cosine x over cosine x. So that's going to give me the equivalent of cosine of x plus 2x sine of x all over cosine of x and then all over 6 root x cosine of x. Hopefully it's not hitting my head on there. In fact, just for the safety thing, since I can't tell where my head is when I'm making these videos, I'll move this up to the top a little bit. So finally what we can do is we've got the denominator over another denominator. We can of course drop it down. And we'll get cosine of x plus 2x sine x all over 6 root x cosine squared of x. And hey, look at that. Twinsies. They are the same thing. So, voila, it does work both ways. Each one was equally challenging. I actually think the second one was a little more challenging um, trig-wise, because you'd have to do a little more trig identity work. But in any event, the process works, and you can s find your answer through whichever path you so choose. Okay, next, that brings us to question number seven. Seven comes from the next section, which asks you to compute each derivative using the new trig rules we derived in class and then factor completely, with again a reminder that factoring isn't essential here, it just cleans up the mess that we have. 
So in this particular case, I do once again see that we have a quotient. I have 4 cosecant over x. Now, once again, I'm not going to demonstrate this one, but you could, of course, see this instead as 4x to the negative 1 times cosine of x and use the product rule, but it actually becomes much more messy that way. So we're going to approach this using the quotient rule, just not my choice. So in fact, I'll put over here for clarity's sake, I'll put no thank you. I'm going to be polite when I reject the potential approach to a problem. The other thing I do want to point out to you is we're obviously going to need the derivative of cosecant here. The derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x cotangent x. And of course, if you're interested in how to find that value in case you forget it, that derivative expression in case you forget it, I'll remind you that d cosine of x is 1 over sine of x. And you could use the quotient rule here. Low d high, derivative of 1 is 0, minus high d low, all over low low. And then it's just a matter of splitting pieces up. Get negative 1 over cosine. So sorry, 1 over sine, excuse me times cosine over sine. Why do I keep writing the right cosine? I don't know. And that, of course, gives you negative cosecant cotangent. So there is your derivative rule. So without further ado, we'll jump in. <clears throat> Low d high. Let's play it safe and just write it this way once. Minus high. D low, that's a really easy derivative to calculate, it's just 1, all over low, low, quotient rule. So there's our derivative, it's ready to go, we just need to evaluate some pieces here. I'll do that right now, I'll do it right below, it's fine. It's going to give us x times negative 4 cosecant x cotangent x, which is fairly crunchy. You know, it's a Nestle Crunch bar there, but we'll be okay. This one, the derivative of x we said was just 1, so this is just minus 4 cosecant of x. And then the whole thing is over x squared. So not terrible. The biggest thing to look at here is, of course, we've got two different pieces, two different terms, both having negative 4 and cosecant of x. So I'm going to factor out a GCF of negative 4 cosecant of x. That leaves me in the rest of this thing. We'll have x cotangent of x. Signs back to positive because we pulled out the negative. And the second one will just literally be 1. And then, of course, this whole thing, that was... I say it's all over, but that's, you know, my hopes of drawing a straight line appear to be all over. It's all over x squared. So again, a pretty solid expression to look at. Okay, next, this brings us to question number nine. It wants us to write the equation of the tangent line two. And our function in question is f of x, known as three tangent of x plus one. So before we do anything else, reminder, tangent lines, of course, involve three components that we need to find, typically. One is the x-coordinate, one is the y-coordinate, both of them are corresponding to the point of tangency. The other one is the slope, which corresponds to our derivative at that particular point. In fact, I'm not going to write f prime of x, but f prime of c. So in looking over here, first, before I do anything else, I might as well find what f of 3 pi over 4 is equal to. So of course, you know, the simplest answer is it's 3 tangent of 3 pi over 4, all plus 1. And that is technically correct, but we can't write that as a final answer because this has an unevaluated function. We need to know what the value of that thing is. So a quick little trig investigation. 3 pi over 4, if you'll recall, is the 45 degree reference angle over here. These are 1s and 1s. If we're looking for the tangent, that's going to be negative 1, opposite over adjacent. So with that in mind, we get 3 times negative 1 plus 1 is negative 3 plus 1, also known as negative 2. So y1 is found, x1 is given. Our next move is to figure out what the slope is. So in order to get there, we need to take the find, or we need to compute the slope function at that particular, at any x value. So we can plug in the one we want. So looking up there, we're going to have 3 times the derivative of tangent. Do you recall the derivative of tangent? Hopefully the answer is secant squared, because that's exactly right. And then the derivative of 1 is 0. So really our derivative is 3 secant squared, but it may be helpful to remind you that when you're evaluating secant squared, if you're less comfortable evaluating secants, 3 times secant is the same thing as 3 over cosine, and of course it's got to be squared because we had secant squared. So with that said, we now need to calculate the slope at specifically 3 pi over 4, which is going to be equal to 3 over the quantity cosine of 3 pi over 4 squared. 
As far as values, the numerator is pretty easy to calculate. It's literally 3. In the denominator, for cosine of 3 pi over 4, looking over here, this is 1, 1, root 2. So the cosine is going to be negative 1 over root 2. You might also know it by the code name negative root 2 over 2. Both are fine. As far as values, this then becomes 3 over 1 half. And finally, that's going to be equal to 3 times 2 over 1, which is 6, interestingly enough. So 6 is now our slope. We've got that. That means that our tangent line for this tangent question function is going to be y minus a negative 2 equal to 6 quantity x minus 3 pi over 4. And voila. There is our tangent line. Again, important stuff in here, things to know. The biggest thing that we added here to an otherwise simple problem was you did have to remember the derivative of tangent. Recall tangent's derivative is positive secant squared of x. It's only the co-functions that have negative derivatives. But in any event, we did it. Okay, that brings us to question 10b. I think it's the last one before that massive free response style question. So in 10, you're asked to, let's see, it says for a continuous differentiable function f of x, ooh, isn't that fancy? Continuous and differentiable. We'll talk more about that tomorrow or soon. It is known that f of 3 is negative 2 and f prime of 3 is 1. So good. We don't know anything else except it exists everywhere, its slope exists everywhere, and we know a point and its slope. It then says to find the slope of the tangent line to each function below at the given x value. So we want tangent line. I don't want to write another tangent. Oh, it doesn't. Just kidding. It says find the slope of the tangent line. So in other words, all we're really looking here for is f prime of c. We don't have to construct the rest of the tangent line. So that's a nice, whew, I'm glad I got rid of that. So here, though, our function is y equals 5 over f of x plus 7. So some people might call this an abstractly defined function. And we're in particular interested at x equals 3. So what I'm going to do, since we're only interested in the slope of the tangent line at that x equals 3, all I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right in to the function. Now, in this particular function, we don't have a way until we do the chain rule tomorrow that we could approach this without using the quotient rule. It's just unfortunate, it just wouldn't work. But at the same time, we can differentiate this with, this with the quotient rule just fine. So looking on, we've got low d high, it's the derivative of 5, minus high d low, we're going to be taking the derivative of f of x plus 7, all over low low quotient rule. So there's our derivative at least set up. And go ahead and calculate these pieces. A couple of them are pretty easy. In particular, the derivative of f of x plus 7 is going to be just f prime of x, because the derivative of 7 is 0. And the denominator, of course, doesn't really clean itself up. We just get f of x plus 7 squared. Now what I want to talk about is the first term here the low d high portion, the denominator times numerator prime. So in here we got f of x plus 7 times the derivative of 5. Now the most common mistake that happens in quotient rule problems is a mistake with these simple derivatives, typically involving a constant, in fact. So in here I have to remind you that if you're interested in the slope of the function y equals 5, y equals 5 looks just like that. Its slope is 0 because it's a horizontal line, it's a constant, so its y values are never changing, so the change in y over change in x is always zero over something, which gives you zero. So in this case, this first term is literally just zero, which means y prime for us is negative five f prime of x over f of x plus seven squared. So with that in place, we now know what our slope is. I now want to evaluate that slope at x equals three. So I want to figure out what the slope is specifically here, because that's what we were asked for, the slope of the tangent line at that x value. So in here, we might call it y prime of 3. It's going to be equal to negative 5 f prime of 3 divided by the quantity f of 3 plus 7 all squared. So notice all I've done is evaluate this by plugging in the 3s. But of course, we can't leave an unevaluated function like f prime or f of 3. So to finish this off, we need to substitute in the correct values. Well, it says up here that f prime of 3 is 1. Thank you for that. Makes it easy. 
In the denominator, it says f prime or f of three is negative two. It says negative two plus seven squared. Now this would be a correct answer, but of course we can do a little bit better. That'll be negative five over five squared, which is negative five over twenty-five, which is negative one fifth. So there's our slope. Nothing really crazy here. You did have to draw some information out, almost like it was from a really simple table. But we'll get to more complex tables in just a second. Okay, that brings us to question number 11, which is the massive free response question on this entire assignment that brings in a whole bunch of stuff, quotient rule and otherwise. So I'm going to go through each part of it just because I always like doing that, especially with these review videos that might be a little bit, might cover some topics that you're a little bit rustier in just because it's been a little while since you did them, I think. So in jumping in here to start off with, question number 11 begins by declaring for us that f and g are continuous differentiable functions. They're giving us values of both f and g and their derivatives f prime and g prime in that table below. And the table is actually right here. Clean enough to eat off of. It says to use the table to answer the questions below. Well, I don't know what else we were going to do. So there we are. Okay, so to start off with, first it says to evaluate a particular limit. So as you've done with these problems in the past, it's worth recognizing in here the definition of the derivative. This one I see h's, so I'm going to assume this is the limit as h goes to 0, of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. But now there's also one small problem, which is in the problem itself, I don't see x plus h's. I see lots and lots of 1 plus h's. What that tells me is that this isn't simply f prime of x, which, by the way, this would be equal to, why did I change color? No. So this is, of course, equal to f prime of x. But let me remind you that if there's no x in the problem, that means it's the derivative being evaluated at a particular point. So in particular, since every one of those places has a 1 in it, 1, 1, 1, 1. It's not like the seagulls, but more obsessed with a multiplicative identity. 1, 1. Since there's a 1 in there, that means we're actually calculating f prime of 1 for whatever f of x happens to be in the problem. So with that in mind, as we've done many times before, we need to figure out what f of x is. So notice f of 1 is at the end. So that means right up there is what we're looking at for our function. And our function involves f, so that's probably a bad choice of letters for the thing. But what it looks to me like is we're trying to differentiate 4x over f of x. And again, you can tell you've done chosen the correct function if you plug in 1 and you get the exact same expression. So this thing at 1 would be 4 times 1 over f of 1. So this is what we need to differentiate. And of course, this whole thing is equal to f prime of 1, or in particular, another variable. In fact, for the sake of simplicity, let me just go change that to another variable is what it is. We'll go g of that. No, g's in the problem too. G's. There. Close. It has h in the problem. Ah, gosh, darn it. Let's just call it l. I don't care. We'll deal with it. Okay, so we want to take the derivative of that function. So let's go differentiate it. Well, I see in looking at it that we've got a function 4x over another function f of x. So I'm thinking quotient rule. I'm not going to do the like parentheses primes this time. I'm just going to do the quotient rule in real time. So, low d high, the derivative of 4x is 4, minus high d low, the derivative of f of x is f prime of x, whatever that means, all over low, low quotient rule. So without further ado, that gives me 4 f of x minus 4x f prime of x. And all of this is over f squared. So now that's helpful, but remember what we are looking for here is we specifically want to figure out what is happening at x equals 1. That's the specific slope and the specific value of the derivative that's being asked for in this limit question. So with that in mind, let's calculate it. Our answer is going to be 4 f of 1 minus 4 times 1 f prime of 1 all over f of 1 squared. Plugging in values, we're looking on this part of the chart. Specifically, we're looking for first f of 1. So f of 1 is 1, so this is going to be 4 minus 4, whatever f prime of 1 is, 
all over 1 squared. f prime of 1 is right there, is negative 2. It's going to yield for us 4 plus 8 over 1 equals 12. So it looks like our answer to this problem is 12. Okay, so that brings us into question 11b. In question 11b, it begins by stating that p of x is equal to f of x times g of x. Probably p for product rule, if you know what I'm saying. Then it says the tangent line to p of x at x equals negative 2, the x-axis, and the y-axis form a triangle in quadrant 2. It's a little interesting and strangely specific. And also triangle? What? Okay, we'll deal with it in a second. It then asks us to find the area of this triangle. So what, my, what I'm picturing here, what I'm trying to think about, is it says that three things, the tangent line, the x-axis, and the y-axis, form a triangle in quadrant 2. So if we imagine drawing out quadrant 2, here's quadrant 2 right up here, we must have a tangent line that looks like this. So that that way, that tangent line ends up providing us a little triangle, specifically the triangle that's like right there. So that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the area of that triangle. So let's kind of sketch this out. Let's figure out some information about the function. Ooh. And let's see if this actually plays out the way it looks. So in order to do this, the part that we need to calculate is specifically the tangent line to p of x at x equals negative 2. So to do that, I'm going to start by figuring out what p of negative 2 is. Well, that means we're just going to have to plug in to f and g. And we'll get f of negative 2 times g of negative 2. And then looking over here, f of negative 2 and g of negative 2 are 2 and negative 1 respectively, which means p of negative 2 is negative 2. So that's interesting. There's actually a point on this function p of x that's at negative 2, negative 2, so somewhere down here. And for the sake of argument, I'm going to place it more like right there. So the tangent line here, in order to be in quadrant 2, can't be negative because then otherwise it would never hit the y-axis in quadrant 2. So what I'm expecting is that we're going to have a positive slope at this point, so that that way we can look at the triangle with those three vertices, which naturally would be a right triangle, in addition to being the right triangle. So from here, I found p of negative 2. But of course, if I want the tangent line, I want to make sure that this problem even works. I need to calculate p prime of negative 2. So I want to first calculate p prime of x. And as we said, since we're multiplying f of x times g of x, we're going to need the product rule. So that means we're going to have f prime times g plus f times g prime. And again, that came via the product rule, which I admit, sadly, has no catchy song to go with it. f prime g plus f g prime. That's the end of the song. Quotient rule. Doesn't work. So there's the product rule in action. For our purposes, though, we, of course, want to find p prime negative 2 specifically so that we can calculate the slope we want. So in looking up here, we're going to need a couple more things. We're going to have f prime of negative 2. It looks like it's 3 times g of negative 2, which is negative 1. Then we're going to have plus f of negative 2, which is 2, and g prime of negative 2, which is 3. So in looking here, we get negative 3 plus 6 equals 3. So that is our slope. That's good. It is positive. It means that our tangent line is y minus, let's see if we can do this correctly. We have a single point on here. Yeah, it's negative 2, negative 2. So y plus 2 equals 3 x plus 2. And just for simplicity here, because we're going to want to talk about this line in relation to other things and intercepts and stuff, I'm going to actually write this in mx plus b form. It's actually going to be the same thing as y equals 3x plus 6. That's me going like this. Minus 2, which in other words is 3x plus 4. So that's the line that we see right up there. I missed, but that's the line we're looking at. So if we have y equals 3x plus 4, our picture indicates that it is in fact going to go through the or go through the two axes. But in order to figure out the area of this triangle, we need to figure out what is the base and what is the height. So specifically, we need to figure out their intercepts. We need to know what is the x-intercept right here and what is the y-intercept right there. So in order to do that, I'm going to just use the function. So first of all, if we want the y-intercept of this linear function, we could either plug in 0 or just remember that it's the constant at the end. So obviously, that's going to be 3 times 0 plus 4 equals 4. So from our perspective, that means that this length is going to be 4. Because up here at 0, 4, the line crosses the y-axis. Likewise, we can do similar work 
with the x-intercept, that's going to be whatever makes the entire function equal 0. So in other words, when does 3x plus 4 equal 0? And that's going to occur at x equals negative 4 over 3. So that means this is going to have a width of 4 thirds. I know that the point itself is negative 4 thirds, comma 0, but the sign doesn't matter when we're talking about area, at least not yet. So from there we have our two ingredients. That means the area of the triangle is going to be, as with every right triangle, and every triangle really, 1 half base times height. And looking at our pieces up there, we have 1 half base times height. That's going to be equal to, looks like 2 thirds times 4, which is equal to 8 thirds. So what you've just seen is a pretty challenging question involving a lot of um, tough work, some product rule, an interesting picture, like knowing your quadrants, being able to draw and sketch a reason, finding intercepts, lots of good stuff, which makes this a really rich question, but one that I think you should be prepared to answer. I don't think this is actually too hard. Maybe it's a little bit crunchier than I'd like, but a pretty good question overall. Okay, next, that brings us to question 11C. 11C asks... Cuts, beats right, gets right to the point. Explain why f of x must have a zero on the interval from negative two to four. So we're interested only in f of x in this particular question. So I'm just gonna scratch out. Obviously I wouldn't recommend doing this because you'll have to use g again, but for now we can focus on it. And it says we want f to have a zero on the interval from negative two to four. So when we're saying things about functions must having a zero, that immediately makes me think about the intermediate value theorem. So that's just a thing that comes up here. When you're asking to guarantee there's a y value or something, if you want to guarantee there's a particular value in there, I think IVT all the way. And if you'll further recall, IVT requires two things to be true, continuity and boundedness. In other words, we've got to have a continuous function to guarantee that all the points are in place, and we've got to have boundedness to guarantee the one we're looking for has to be in between. So what I'm going to do is each of these checks. So first in looking here, f is continuous. Question is, is that true? Yes, it's true. Why? They gave it to us. It was given in the problem. Let f and g be continuous. Okay. Thanks. The second piece then we have to look at are the endpoints. Do the endpoints bound to the zero value that we're looking for? Now specifically, f of negative 2 is equal to 2. And then f of 4 says is equal to negative 3. So of course 0 is in fact between negative 3 and 2. So that means we have continuity because we were told it and boundedness because we proved it. So from now we just need to invoke the intermediate value theorem properly. So stating the formal pieces as much as possible since f of x is continuous and f of 4 is less than 0 is less than f of negative 2 by the intermediate value theorem and I'm going to write it all out, why not? Why? Because I probably should eat lunch at some point here, it's almost it's after 2 o'clock. By the intermediate value theorem f of c equals 0 for some value c between negative 2 and 4. And there is the explanation that we would be looking for. And again, you're welcome to write ivt instead, but just don't put another accidental vt in there by mistake. So again, nothing really related to the quotient rule, just an opportunity to force you to invoke the intermediate value theorem and remember what's required about it. Okay, question d. How many do we have here? We'll go all the way down for a little while. Okay, so in D, it says, let u of x equal a massive looking piecewise function. If I wasn't the one that wrote these questions, I'd be pretty angry and frustrated with the person that writes these questions, even though they are excellent representations of the sorts of things you're going to have to do later. So let u of x equal massive piecewise function. Then it says to find the value of k for which u of x is continuous at x equals 4. So we're interested in continuity at a point. We're given a piecewise function. So in order for continuity, for something to be continuous, let's recall the three things that we need. So in other words, if we want f continuous 
at x equals c. We need first f of c. It needs to be defined. Second, we need the limit as x goes to c of f of x. And then third, we need the two things to be equivalent. They need to be, all points need to be in the correct spot. So that said, to do this, let's check all three. Again, I'm being a little over precautious here and reviewing some stuff because it might have been a while. So the first thing we need to check if we want continuity for u at x equals 4 is we need to make sure u of 4 is defined. Well, looking in here, x is greater than or equal to 4 implies the parabola. So it's going to be 4 squared times 3, minus 3 times 4, 16 minus 12, which is 4. 4 is defined. It's defined very well. It's 1, 2, 3, 4. Hell, 4 is in the problem. So really, 4 looks pretty good. Step 1 looks safe. The second one, though, the limit as x approaches 4 of u of x. In order to find that value, we're going to need to find both of these branches meeting at the same place. So we need to show that the limit as x approaches 4 from the left side of u of x is equal to the limit as x approaches 4 from the right side of u of x. That's, that's what we're looking for here. So we need to calculate each of those two things. In other words, we need to verify that the left-hand limit equals the right-hand limit at x equals 4. So in looking here, let's calculate our pieces. We'll do each piece. This might be enough, in fact, for us to finish. So first, the limit as x approaches 4 from the left side of u of x. That's going to draw out of the more complicated portion of our problem. So in there, if we're plugging in 4 at those values less than 4, we're going to have f of 4 minus k over g of 4 plus 3k. And cleaning that up a little bit, f of 4 and g of 4, that's going to be negative 3 minus k over 4 plus 3k. So nothing to help us with just yet, but all good. Next, we need to figure out what the limit as x approaches 4 from the right side is for u of x. And that's just going to be 4 squared minus 3 times 4 again, which is 16 minus 12, or 4. So in other words, what we've just found are the two separate one-sided limits for both sides as x approaches 4. And if the limit as x approaches 4 of u of s exists, or u of x exists, that's going to imply that the left-hand limit, negative 3 minus k over 4 plus 3k, is going to equal 4. So truthfully, at this point, we aren't going to need to check any more steps here. This is required for this to be true. This is an equation with one variable, k. So all we need to do is solve it. So at this point, since we're solving, I'll change colors to green. So I'm going to look at this as 4 over 1 equals something. So I'm going to cross multiply. Again, it's your call how you show that. I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to I know, do, do, cross multiply. What is it going to leave us with? It's going to give me negative 3 minus k times 1 is equal to 4 times 4 plus 3k. So it's algebra time. Left side is negative 3 minus k. The right side is 16 plus 12k. So moving some ingredients around here, I'm going to add k to both sides. I'm going to subtract 16 from both sides. We're going to get negative 19 equals 13k. Or more importantly, k is equal to negative 19 over 13. So after all that work to make this continuous, we needed k to be equal to negative 19 over 13. So in order to get there, though, the important stuff is to remember a little bit about that definition of continuity. Truthfully, you should remember it all, but remember it. Go through the steps, and in particular, remember that if we want that second step and the limit to exist, we need the left-hand limit to equal the right-hand limit. And again, nothing but a little bit of algebra to get there. But in any event, a nice challenging recall question for you focused on continuity and manufacturing it. Okay, last but not least, ooh, we have a calculator question. Let me prepare this by telling it to find the TI Smart View calculator. So in question 11E, it states, let m of x equal the natural log of x cubed plus cosine of 2x. That, my friends, is a function that we are not yet prepared to differentiate, at least not define like m prime of x4. So keep in mind that's probably why this is going to be calculator needed. So we're going to need you calculator. Next it says, if a of x is one-third g of x plus m of x, what is the equation of the tangent line to a of x at x equals 1? 
It looks like we need a question mark right there, or else I need to change it to find. So forgive me there, I'll have to fix that in a little bit. So in here though, we've got a bunch of stuff that we need to look at. So, geez. So in order to start this, let's just start with the things that we need for a tangent line. So for a tangent line, one thing we're gonna need is we're gonna need A of one, right? Because we're gonna need to know what the Y value is. That's gonna give us our Y. So in here, looking at our ingredients, we're gonna have one third G of one plus M of one. And specifically, one third G of one, G of one is five. So that's one third of five plus M of one, which of course we could put in here as ln of one cubed plus cosine of two times one, shoot, times one, and we could evaluate that. For simplicity though, I wanna make sure that I have this value. I wanna make sure that I have it as a decimal so that we were ready and prepared to go. No, I'm not gonna activate it just yet. Gotta see if the school will willingly pay for my license. Okay, trial version it is. So we wanna calculate this whole thing. It's gonna be, oops, let's clear all the rest of the mess. It's gonna be five thirds plus the natural log of one plus the cosine of two. That gives me 1.12856. In fact, you know what? This is a good time as any. I'm not gonna use an approximation sign, and here's why. 0.128, we had a few more decimals. 5609, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I know my final answer isn't going to be A of one. A of one is just a part of this final answer that we're working towards. It's one of the intermediate calculations we call it because they're in the middle of all the rest of the work we're doing. So in here, I don't wanna use approximations because I might need to use this later. In this particular case, I won't, but I might theoretically need this. So instead what I'm doing is I'm just gonna define it as the full decimal, skipping at least the last value of the decimal presented on the calculator and putting dot, dot, dot. That would preserve complete decimal integrity for the entire rest of the calculation in case we need to do something with it. Um, so again, don't round intermediate answers. So again, I'm being really careful here. So that was our first move. Our second move is we need to calculate the slope. So that's gonna be y prime, which specifically is going to be a prime is gonna come from a prime of x. So in looking here, if a of x is one third g of x plus m of x, that means our derivative is gonna be one third g prime of x plus m prime of x. As we said before, we're not prepared to calculate out g prime or m prime of x. So from here though, if we do g prime of one, we'll do it this way, we'll be as careful as possible. If we do g prime of one, g prime of 1 is 6, which means this is 1 third of 6 plus m prime of 1, which is equal to 2 plus m prime of 1. So what we're missing, of course, is m prime of 1. So I need my graphing calculator to help me with that. So I want to calculate the derivative of ln of x cubed plus cosine of 2x. So I'm going to math 8 and put it in an x. I'm going to tell it we're going to calculate the slope at 1 for this thing. And then I'm gonna put in the function, which was ln of x cubed plus the cosine of two x, parenthesis, parenthesis. And then I'm gonna press enter, and this should return for me the slope, and it does. So that slope is 2.02345051. So I could write this, of course, as two plus 2.02, was it two, three, four? Two, three, three, four, five, six, dot, dot, dot. But more importantly, we wanted that slope. So a prime of one is gonna be equal to four, point zero, two, three, four, five, six, dot, dot, dot. So we now have our y value. We have our slope value. Our x value was provided for us as x equals one. We're ready to include the tangent line. So specifically our tangent line is going to be y minus and now at this point we're ending the problem. This is gonna be the final answer we present. Like we'll be boxing this when we're done. So I'm gonna now round my answer. So I'll have 1.129 equals our slope, which was 4.023, quantity x minus one. But we did round this answer. So we could also instead write it as one, y minus 1.128 equals 4.023, quantity x minus one. So either of these answers would be acceptable. 
And again, this gave us an opportunity to just quickly reveal, review using the graphing calculator. And it's our first time writing a tangent line with calculator um, decimally kind of crunchy looking slopes and y values. So in any event, you've now seen all of question number 11. I believe that was it. It was. So without further ado, thank you for watching. I'm Mr. Steele. I hope this has been informative and helpful and as always useful to you. Have a good night.